this seems like a pretty extreme statement, and my taxi driver um, is not some sort of psychotic killer. Um, and I am here today to talk about AI. Um, when we start to think about how we trust AI and what we ask AI, one of the questions we ask them is a very simple question. That simple question is, if you're driving down the road and there's a child crossing the road and there is a mother on the footpath, a grandmother on the footpath, and you have an option, you can kill one of those or you can drive off the side and kill yourself and your passenger. My taxi driver said they would kill the grandmother. They would kill the grandmother because the grandmother had lived a longer life. Now, for me, this was very uncomfortable because I thought the actual logical answer here was that they would kill us, that we would drive off, we were the ones in the car, and therefore we should be the ones to die. But the question is infinitely complex, and everyone has a different view of it. And there is no correct answer, and this is what we're doing. We're asking AI questions so that we can establish how to trust and understand what the way it thinks when we don't actually know the answer ourselves. We have absolutely no clue of what the correct answer to that question is, but we use it. And if everyone here in the room was to stand up and say who they would kill, we would get a divergence in what people are talking about. In order for us to move forward, we have to build a symbiotic relationship with AI. And in order for that symbiosis to exist, we have to have trust on both sides. And that's what I want to talk about today. Leaving home, when I was 18, I got in a bus, I couldn't afford a plane, they don't pay well in the day after. And when I got in a bus and on a ferry and I traveled overnight, I arrived in Victoria Station. And I went from a town where we have 622 people to a city where you have 8 million. Um, and I landed and it was 9 o'clock in the morning and London was in full flow. And it was mind-boggling. It was absolutely terrifying, exhilarating, fantastic, all in one go. I met with Mickey. Mickey Kelly was a good friend of mine. He'd moved a few months earlier, and he had moved over with Carl Scott, another friend. And they met me at the station, brought me out. And the first thing I did was go and get my ear pierced. I did this because my mom had told me that I could never get my ear pierced as long as I was living in her house. <laughs> We went back to the house, we met Declan Scott. Declan was uh, here a few years, and they worked with me. They developed me. They helped me to become a better person, a person who understood how to live in a city. They helped me to find work. They explained where I should go, who I should talk to. They made the whole experience relatively painless, apart from some really stonking hangovers, um, of, quite, of which there was a few, but we had great fun. Now we move into a new age. Now I'm in a situation where I do not have that guide. I don't have a Mickey, I don't have a Declan, and I don't have a Carl. Nobody to help me, but none of you do. Absolutely nobody has anyone that can guide or help us in this age because we have absolutely no idea what it means. No one's ever lived here before, and there's no context on which we can give anyone. So, We've got to start to imagine what it will be like. Well, first off, it's an age, and therefore, over time, it's going to progress. And we've got to understand what are the natural progressions in those ages. At the moment, we chop it up into three general areas. We talk about the narrow AI. We talk about general AI, and then we talk about superhuman AI. Now, narrow AI is very straightforward. It is the ability to do a single task or type of task, like recognize a face, understand language, and narrow AI is here now. We use it every day of the week. And some people will say, it's not AI. Right? Those people will say, no matter what we produce, it is not AI because they want to feel comfortable. The reality is we already live in this narrow AI age. This narrow AI age is something that is starting to challenge our norms. It's starting to take jobs. It's starting to change the way we look at the world. If you don't believe me, ask Alexa or Siri. When we go on from that age and we start to think about what's next, we start to think about general AI. General AI is um, it's the point of where it asks us why. It says, I can't do that. I'm sorry, Dave. General AI is when it matches us in intelligence. 
General AI is something that we are scared of, and rightly so, because it's the point of where it is as good at applying intelligence in random situations as we are. Once we get past that age, or that era within the age, we start to move into what we have now defined as superhuman AI. Superhuman AI is what human beings do when we don't know what else to do. We invent something completely new that's infinite that we can't possibly get our heads around, and it is one of the things that drives our discovery. It's the thing that makes us think, what if? But we don't have a clue because it's superhuman and we're humans. So we have no clue what it's about and we're still trying to think it through. And I think when we think about that, we are in incredibly internally challenged. We're not in a place where we know the answers. We're not in a place where anyone can help us, but we have to keep moving forward. Now, when we start to think about this, and when we start to challenge ourselves and we move forward into these areas, we inevitably start to do what I think is fundamentally wrong. We start to think about all of this AI as artificial humans. It can't be. When we're talking about artificial intelligence, we are talking about taking one bit of us, a small part of us, an intelligence part of us, and moving that into something else. We don't know how to move hormone systems in. We don't know how to move pain systems in. We don't know how to move vast amounts of what is a human system. And we're in that place where we can only imagine it as this sentient being that's going to take over the world. It's a amorphous thing that will control us all. But the reality is AI is not one thing. AI is a piece of software. So we have lots of different variations. We have thousands of people working all over the world building different AI systems. The chances of all those systems voting in a dictator and ending up with this master sentient being just isn't going to happen. To me, we need to start thinking about it differently. We need to think about it more in terms of a new species. We need to think about this species that is learning. It's got parts of what we have, but it isn't fully formed. It's like a baby. Now, when we start to think about how does a baby develop and how would this species develop, it gets really scary because what we do is we prejudge. We prejudge how we would develop. And I think we need to start thinking about this differently. We have a situation at the moment where if I go to the EPA website, uh, which is the Environmental Protection Agency website in America, and we type in the words climate change. It tells us it's an archived topic. Now, we know the reason for that, and it's bad leadership. But these leaders are actually controlling the information that's available. We haven't started to think that through in an AI world. We haven't started to think about, well, what happens if somebody from Pakistan is developing an AI system, they want to learn about America, what did they do? They pointed at the US government site and they said, go learn about America. While the AI is there, it suddenly discovered that climate change is an archive topic. They don't need to worry about it in their world anymore. Now, we know for a fact that bad information gives us bad outcomes. I was discussing it with William there earlier that Microsoft launched a thing called T. Tay was a Twitter bot, and it went racist, massively racist, because people started to interact and play with it and decided to see if they could make it racist, and they were successful. We've got Norman. Um, if you don't know who Norman is, Norman was an AI bot developed by MIT Labs, and it was taught using some seriously dark information. That dark information means that it sees the world as violent. It sees everything through a lens of violence. And we understand that actually they're starting to think and develop their thoughts in the way that a child does. If you teach a child to be racist, it will be racist. If you teach it that um, climate change doesn't exist, it'll understand that climate change doesn't exist. Now, people will point out that both of these two things are experiments, and therefore they're not relevant. That's 
okay, but in America at the moment, and soon to be over here, there is an artificial intelligence system in use by the judicial system. That artificial intelligence system advises judges on potential uh, jail terms and profiles individuals. And it's active, it's live, it actually, it's, I think it's mandatory in Denver, or, or it's one, one of the areas anyway. And what it does, it gives a profile to a judge who then decides if you're going to sentence it. All sounds okay and fine, until uh, one of the American publications did an analysis of 7,000 of the cases that went through and found out that actually it's racist, or at least they purport that it's racist, and that its outcomes are completely racially biased. Somebody went, that was, got a long jail sentence, they went to court and said, well, I want to see the algorithm. They went, no, you can't see the algorithm. Well, can I see the data? Can I see how this came up? No, you're not allowed to see that. You're only allowed to see the result. This, for me, is a really fundamental problem with how we're approaching this. So we have an AI that's making a decision on a human being. You're not allowed to know how it actually came up with that decision. And that is scary. So we need to start to think about how do we go on from there? How do we build trust? Well, we've already got models for trusting stuff we don't understand. We don't understand religion properly. We don't understand science properly. These are topics that are too vast for any individual to completely understand it. But our models handle them. We cope with them. So we know we can achieve that. We know we can get ourselves into that place. So what do we do? Well, our usual first question is, can we put it in a box? Can we lock it up so that we can't, you know, it can't escape? Um, no, you can't. AI has already escaped. Um, if I go onto the web now, I can use AI as a service, as a pay-as-you-go model. I can download components thanks to OpenAI and Apache and several other organizations. I can build an AI system right now, and thousands of people have. We don't know who, we don't know what they're using them for, and we don't know what data sets they're pointing those pieces of information at. So it's too late. We have seen that with Facebook, when you have two AIs, they can invent their own language. So when you've got thousands of AIs available already on the web, we have absolutely no idea of where they are or even how to go and find them or how to turn them off. So that option is not there. So what do you do if you don't lock it in a box? Well, you poke it with a stick, right? You poke it, see it, how it reacts, and dissect it and get an understanding of it. And when you, when you do that, you generally see its reactions and you understand it. And that is a bit more feasible. We can poke AI with a stick. And when we're looking at poking AI with a stick, what we're really looking at is how does it react? What's its internal decision-making process? And within that, we can start to get some sense of where it's all going. Um, there's internal reward systems, and we can promote the fact that it is, can explain itself and should explain itself to us. And past that, we actually have one real, un, sorry, I have one real belief. We have one reality, which is this is here, and we have to figure out how. Well, one of the best ways to do that is actually use AI to support our trust in not only AI, but each other and build, actually, models around us where we not only trust AI, but use it to understand what is fake, what is not fake, and what a world will look like when we actually have a lot more transparency and openness. We start to look at reimagining this world. What does this world look like? It can do absolutely amazing things. I imagine it in the context of Libby Kelly, my sister-in-law, waking up one morning. and Overnight, two AIs have got together, and they have managed to figure out how to solve Hunter's disease, a degenerative progressive disease that Max, her little boy, has. I imagine a world where some other bot has cured cancer. Another bot has figured out how we can easily desalinate water. There was a bot that was due to sort out climate change, but it read the website and it decided it was not a problem. <laughs> But we have a real opportunity here to, to see these things happen in our lifetime. But I also have another view that, that we can use AI to surround ourselves and to create a world where it understands us, where it protects us, where it looks after us, 
where it tells us what's fake and it gives us a much better understanding of the world that's around us and in doing so allows us to recreate society. It allows us to cut through the propaganda. It allows us to cut through the lies and understand exactly what's happening around us. And one of the most challenging questions, is this the end for humanity? Do we end up as a result of superhuman AI being ants? Are we the tiny ones? It's possible. It's a long way away, but it's possible. But I don't think of it that way. I prefer to think of it as a new beginning. A beginning where we get a chance, we get an opportunity to completely relook at the world and society. We get an opportunity where we can set down baselines by which we all agree. We still need to answer that question. Who was the right one to kill in that scenario? And we will never get absolute agreement but we can get agreement on baselines. We can get agreement that the Earth is not flat. Right? These are certain things that we can write, we can put down in systems. We can point these AI systems at those and say, this is a definitive source. And hopefully in the process of doing all that, Libby will wake up and Max will be cured. Thank you.